John Burbank controls more than $4 billion as co-founder and chief investment officer of Passport Capital. He made his name as one of the first to spot the subprime crisis coming. And these days, he's concerned about resource scarcity. What will happen to the United States as well once quantitative easing ends? I spoke to Burbank yesterday after a hedge fund conference at AT&T Field out here in San Francisco. And I asked him if he thinks we need a QE3 now. Well, there's a need for QE2 to stop, as they said it was going to first, and then we'll see how things react. And I think risk assets will come off, and then we'll get a better picture of how the world really is. Um, but we have to fund $2 trillion of deficits next year. Um, so the question is, who's going to come up with the sort of $800 billion that's missing? And it's either going to be banks or it's going to be the Fed. So how long does that period last where we see some complacency? I mean, how long of a test period before you see that really become a worry? <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, the second quarter of last year, uh, after MBS purchases ended, mortgage-backed security purchases right, was ended. pretty severe. And it directly led to <laughs> QE2. So mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to, hard thing to say. Um, it's, it, we'll see what else happens. So we'll see where commodity prices are, which are certainly depressed into growth and, and, uh, and, and profits. Um, we'll see what the government's doing in terms of cutting spending or not. Um, you know, obviously, cutting spending is inflationary, uh, as is uh, the end of QE2. Um, so it's, a, it's just a, they're going to have to reevaluate. But I, I would never, I would never trust the Fed uh, to talk about whether they're going to do QE3 or not now. Mm -hmm. First, they have to get through the end of QE2. You believe in resource, resource scarcity here, peak oil uh, and the like, um, and you invest around that. When it comes to the Middle East, we've seen the high cost to the rest of the world of mm -hmm. inflation pressures at home, and we're learning the high cost yeah. uh, to the price of oil at the same time. Why are you the biggest investor in the Saudi markets at a time of global instability? Yeah, so I believe in persistent resource scarcity, meaning this is what it's going to be for, for a long time. Let's just say the next 10 years. Um, I guess we're the biggest one because we started focusing on the Middle East um, in uh, 06, 07, after having spent a lot of time on uh, the billion, you know, billion plus uh, economy of China, the billion plus economy of India. And then I thought, I better start paying attention to a billion Muslims in the world. And the GCC is not you know, where all, all of them live, but because Saudi's got 20% of the world's oil and all of the swing capacity, and because I think there's scarcity, then I really need to understand the governance of that. I need to understand the reality of that surplus capacity. And then I need to understand, what are they going to do with all that money? Um, it's not hard to imagine a Ramco at some point in the future having a trillion dollars of revenues. You know what? You know I should pay attention to, you know, the, uh, trillions, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a trillion, potentially of a trillion, I should understand what's going to happen to it. I think now that when I speak to institutional investors, they're awakening to the relevance of Saudi. They had never really thought about it before, and so I would imagine that you know, as what's happening in the Middle East has relevance, we're going to understand it a lot better. It's not just a place of oil and a place of Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. It's actually a place of, of, of change, and with scarcity of oil, we're really going to have to start understanding what that really means. Is that the emerging market of sorts that you're most interested in right now? Well, it is on, on a relative basis. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you know. We, a hedge fund in San Francisco, should be one of the largest investors in the Saudi market. You know, mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense, and I would say that's probably not going to be the case in a year or two from now. But Saudi's not in any index. You know, it's so it's not like any institutional money gets there by default. Let's talk uh, about what's happening here at home. You think it was a mistake for the Fed to allow financial firms to issue dividends and buyback shares? Yes. I don't know why the governments and the Feds are allowing equity investors in banks to. Benefit so much, you know. The, the TARP, Why? TARP bailed out the, you know, the equity holders. There's no reason equity holders and banks should have ended up with anything, let alone you know bond holders. But I think it was to make things seem like things were okay, right? If I'm the equities are you okay, don't have a stake in these financial firms. No, I do not. Right now, <laughs> you might be I'm, speaking I differently. Don't, I don't have a negative stake in them too because I have no idea what the the next thing the governments are going to do. You're, you're not even short financials. No, I, I, I have no opinion. But it, it's definitely a, a regulatory issue, not a not a you know bottom up just you know f financial corporate issue. But I say to letting them pay dividends when they're not lending, you know, in the way you want, doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you let capital leave their balance sheets? you know, going to 
equity holders instead of being lent, mm -hmm. right, or, or to buy treasuries. I don't understand that. I think it's just another way of uh, pretending that things are, you know, stable and back to normal. So I, I don't get it. Real quickly, you made um, you got a lot of attention back in 2007 for your early and correct call on a subprime mortgages and the housing crisis to come. Where do you think we are right now in the recovery? Not recovering. Not so at all. I, I don't think. I mean, housing prices are still falling. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, and what we haven't yet seen is Treasury rates, you know, significantly rise. I mean. It, there's a mortgage duration issue here, which is if you get a, a low coupon mortgage uh, and therefore you know, a good mortgage and you're there for 15, 30 years and then rates rise, you're not going to refinance out of that. You know, the, whole, the whole process kind of uh, is stuck. So I anticipate a lot of people being stuck in their houses for a long time because what we haven't yet seen is inflation um, and, uh, and, and a proper discounting of the ability from America to pay back its bills mm -hmm. mean a higher treasury rate. So the Fed is stuck with owning a lot of mortgages. And the longer it goes, the worse that investment's going to be. John Burbank of Passport Capital.